So, uh, today we're going to go study the streams for visually guided actions. And that is this thing on top here, the where stream. So that's going to be the subject of today's lecture. And um, we saw from before that we had, uh, from the visual system, two streams separating a what stream going underneath the cortex and a where stream going on top to the parietal lobe. And this dorsal stream or action stream or where stream is concerned with the representations of space. So in other words, uh, you want to know where things are relative to you so you can act on them in some way. Um, and we'll see today that there are different re representations of space. Um, you can make an eye movement to something in the room. Uh, you can try to grasp something, you can reach something, or you can try to place, m move something that, that, that you grabbed and place it in your mouth. Um, and you have to pay attention to where things are located, their locations, and then um, to, to how you act on them can be done relatively automatically. So if the mouse is to your right, you'll automatically reach with your right hand. If the mouse is to your left, you'll reach with the left hand. So a lot of the, a lot of the, the dorsal stream stuff occurs unconsciously. The other thing that's different about the two streams is that the what stream was, yes? Someone has a amputation. Would their brain change so that they can do the left or the right hand? No, I, I think uh, they would adapt and, and be able to automatically reach with their other hand, um, th they'll have more difficulty because it's harder to reach across your body, uh, but, uh, but they'll do it as unconsciously and automatically as you would. So the, the other thing the, 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 that's different about the two streams is that um, uh, the what stream is subject to these illusions. So for example, uh, th this line looks a bit sh shorter than this line. But as you see here, they're actually the same length. Um, the, the wear stream is not subject to, th to these illusions. So if I point, want to point to the end of the line, I can point to the end of the line with my mouse, and I can point to the end of this line accurately without my mouse, with, with my mouse. So um, the, my, my wear stream um, reaches to where things really are. And so, um, it, 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 so it's not subject to these illusions. And you, you, um, you can, that's because you want to be, you want to accurately move to where things are and not where your what stream perceives them to be. The other thing that's different about the two streams, we saw this before, is their, their um, representation in terms of coordinate systems. This one, the dorsal stream, um, measures things with respect to you. And that's because you want to act on things with respect to you. And that you could be your eyes move into your head, so it's relative to your head. Uh, you hear things, as we'll see in a moment, relative to your head. So um, uh, that, again, is, is a coordinate system. Now, the, again, the, the, you see things with your eye. So what you see is with respect to the back of the eye, that is, with respect to the retina. So when I, when I look at something, um, objects appear to, to the right of my retina, the left of my retina, 
and so I know that I should move my eyes one way or the other in order to look at them. So they, with respect to what the eye sees, it knows where the, it should move the eye. Now, the ears are mounted on your head, and so what you hear is not with respect to the eye, but with respect to the head, at least the early parts of your auditory system. Um, and then your fingers are mounted in your body. So again, you want to know what your fingers look, finger locations are with respect to your body. So all these are different egocentric representations that different parts of this wear stream encode. And the patients with lesions of this area have difficulty, depending on where the lesion is, in either making eye movements like saccades, or grasps, or reaches, or feeding. Now, all these different areas are located around the sulcus here, called the interparietal sulcus. This is the, the, the key locations around which all the areas that we'll talk about today are located. And this is a good place for this sort of integration to occur because information from the eye can quickly flow to it. Information from touch can quickly flow to it. And information in hearing can also uh, go to this, this part. So you can act on things you touch or you hear or you see. Now, one of these areas is located over here, and it's called the parietal eye field, PEF. And it, it, it basically helps you um, attend to what you're looking at. So this is where you're, the seat of the attention system lies with respect to movements. And neurons here, you can pay attention to things that you see or things that you hear, and possibly also with touch. Another location whoops, is called the parietal arm field. And it's, there are two spots in it. They're both similar in nature. And again, um, they, again, uh, because the eye is what's seeing it, they code the sort of locations in space, but they're this space called peripersonal space. So it's a, it's a space you can reach to with, with your arm. Okay. And if, then they, uh, they get visual and touch information. And when you have lesions of this, you have optic ataxia, and that is uh, optic means something you, well, that you see, and ataxia means um, the movement is disordered. So in this case, it's, you can't reach visually to objects. Another area that's s somewhat similar is called the parietal grasp field. And this is, in grasping is different from reaching. Reaching is just getting to the location you want to go to, reaching for your mouse. But actually grasping it, you have to know a little bit about what it is that you're grasping. You want to know the shape of the thing that you're grasping. And grasping um, uh, a strawberry here, you grasp it differently for when, if you're picking up uh, let's say a knife, a, 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 the strawberry here, you pick it up in a way that you can put it in your mouth. Uh, a knife you reach by its handle. So you have to know some information from your visual system and from your watch stream of what it is that the object you're grasping is. So he, here information is coming from the watch stream to this where 
area in order to give you that information. And then there's an area called the parietal face field. And as you can see from this image here, I'm picking up the, the strawberry and placing it in my mouth, okay, directing it to my mouth. Okay, so again, you would have visual input and also touch input because um, especially the touch receptors around your face that you need to get information from. If you miss and hit your nose, well, the next time you learn to reach, put it in a little lower. Imagine as a child, this is what their, their, their early problems are with you being able to feed themselves, besides enjoying the texture of food. So these are all egocentric areas, and the, the space that they act on is very different. The parietal eye field is the, is the one that has the biggest range because it's concerned with things that you can look at. And they're, of course, much different from um, the parietal arm field, which is areas that you can reach to. And the grasp field is more concerned with your hand and the object itself. And finally, the parietal face field is more concerned with areas around the face. So they have their different parts of egocentric space. And again, the difference with the grass field is unique because it has the ability not only to know where the location of something is, but also what that object is. Now, the parietal face field, let's look at that. Um, that neurons here are activated um, with locations with respect to the head. So here they get you 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 if you touch where well, there's one neuron here that's particularly sensitive to something touching the, the the lower lip here. There'll be other cells that be activated by touching other parts of the face. Now they are also active to something approaching, but not necessarily touching the lower lip. So just the vision of something heading for that particular location will activate that cell. And similarly, if it was a, a neuron was sensitive to touch, let's say, around the eyes, it would be sensitive to motion heading to that location. And what direction that um, object is coming from, in this case a banana, is immaterial as long as it's heading for that particular location on the head from any direction. And, and finally, and mo most impressively, it doesn't care where the eye is pointing. Okay? So even when you're looking up, the image of that banana heading towards your bottom lip will be quite different from when you're looking down or to the left or to the right. And yet, um, that image, with, so that object could be approaching your lower lip without touching it, and still that same neur neuron will be activated because somehow the brain has computed from that image that that's where this object is heading for. So it's somewhat amazing that the brain is able to, to compute that from different way the object is moving. And so it's not activated if the uh, object is heading to some other parts of the phrase, such as the brow. Now we talked about uh, a type of eye movement called saccades. And uh, we've covered that briefly in other lectures. We mentioned that in, in the first lecture, that there's something called um, a, a reflex 
um, from the eye through the superior colliculus, those neurons that are in the magnocellular portions of the superior, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, no, yeah, to the magnocellular portion of the thalamus to the superior colliculus. Um, and they then go rapidly to the eye mo motor centers and do a quick saccade of the eyes to that location. And so they're short latency saccades or express saccades. There's another route that's much, quite a bit more, more synapses, and it goes from the eye through the thalamus again to the visual cortex and to your parietal eye field, that, that's where tension occurs, and then to the prefrontal cortex and the frontal eye fields, and from then down to the superior colliculus and to your motor system. So you can see that this is an equivalent circuit for generating the same type of eye movement, but it takes much longer. And it goes around this more circuitous route because you sometimes want to look to um, a location that you remember an object to be. So I remember that Catherine's over there, and so I look to her based on the memory I, I, I remember where she sat down. Okay, So the, the memory of objects in your working memory is over here in the prefrontal cortex, and that then generates activity in your frontal eye fields, and then you make that longer latency movement to that location that you choose yourself voluntarily. Now, all these, this activity um, you can think of as hills of activity on a, let's say, a sheet that you can, of neurons here that, that is the spirit colliculus. Here's the foveal region of the superior colliculus, which is small because it's largely concerned with things in the periphery, things coming from the, your magnocellular cells telling you where things are. So in, you want to move, move your eyes to where you see things in your periphery. So the fovea is relatively un, unimportant for the superior colliculus. It's not concerned with what that is. It's concerned with where things are. So they have large receptive fields, and so uh, when an object <coughs> appears, it lights up a bunch of neurons that you can imagine the bottom of this hill, but the, there's a maximum activity amongst a, a small number of them, and so you can consider this activity as a hill of activity. Now, so you can imagine that when you objects appear uh, over in your periphery, an object over the right, and an object to the left, an object down, you first get activity somewhere in this peripheral area of the spirit colliculus. And then that generates a movement of the eye to that location. And then activity appears in the center, because now that's where you're looking at. Your, if your eye moved correctly, it, this CAD would end up with that target in your fovea. And so that's uh, where that hill of activity would be. Now, what's interesting is that the activity coming from the fovea actually has an active purpose. So from the superior colliculus, it goes down to the motor command. But if it's from the fovea, the circuit acts to stop movements, OK? Maintain fixation, OK? So that, that inhibits the cats. And so somehow, before you get a movement going from your periphery, it has to be strong enough to cause that activity in the fovea to disappear, and this activity 
to take over. Okay, so this one goes down and then this one goes up. And when that one appears in the fovea, then that saccade is initiated. Now, all the structures that we'll talk about today have the same sort of rep representation. You can think of them as a sheet or a map of neurons. Um, in each one, you have the fovea represented, and then in the blue, the periphery. Now, do you notice in, 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 in the retina, the fovea is quite small, because physically, in the fovea, it's just a few degrees. But in off this small portion of the fovea, you have a big representation in V1. But then it becomes small again in these um, areas that are in this where dorsal stream. Because again, this dorsal stream is not concerned with recognizing what it is you're looking at. It's concerned with what's happening over to the side. So it's all these blue areas on the peripheral of the retina that are largely represented. Okay. So if we, when we, let's say we, we, we stimulated B, we simulated this appeared and we simulated this location, the eye would then look to that location and similarly, if we stimulated this other location, uh, that the eye would turn to that location and you'd look at that. But if we stimulated both at the same time, if both these um, neurons were to fire for some reason at the same time, then of course they would cancel each other. So only one area generally becomes active at any one time. The other thing is that um, this dotted line represents a, a division. Like there's, the, this is, there's, there's one retina, but there's two, two halves of it, the, the one to the right and one to the left. But then each of these goes to different halves of the brain. So this is one half of V1, and this is on the other cortex. The same thing here two halves. And finally it moves the eye, sends signals to the eye muscles. So this is a, a more um, accurate anatomical representation of it. There's the brain, there's all our locations on the parietal eye field here at the back of the head. This orange line here is the central sulcus. It divides the frontal lobe from parietal lobe. And, um, and these are these different maps. Now, we'll look at for a moment what happens to activity in these areas when we do simple, four simple everyday tasks. The first one is you, you're looking straight ahead and you're given the task, your task is to continue <coughs> to look straight ahead in spite of the fact that it's a flashes off to the side, in this case, your left side. And so if A, an A appears on your left side, whether or not you're attending to it or not, uh, it's that activity will appear in your visual cortex. But if you happen to be not attending to it, and in most likelihood, if you're asked not to look at it, you might voluntarily not attend to it, you might concentrate on whatever you're looking at in the fovea, and so no activity will appear here in the parietal eye field or here in the frontal eye field, and you won't move your eyes. And so these other areas will be blind to that stimulus. There's no, there's no activity there. Now, if, on the other hand, we were asked to, uh, to move there, um, you, if you look carefully in this diagram, you see 
activity on this map of the frontal eye fields. And you can sometimes see activity here in the middle portion. It's not very well drawn, but that's the, the foveal region. So whenever the eye is still, it's the foveal region that lights up. Whenever, just before a movement occurs, an activity appears here, as well as here, as well as here. So from V1, activity moves to the frontal eye field, the parietal eye field, and then to the frontal eye field. And because you're paying attention to it, all this activity is transmitted, that elicits a hill of activity here. It reduces uh, activity in your fovea, and a saccade is launched. And you look at A. And when, when you get to A, the, when your eye gets to where it's going to, then activity, your fixation resumes. You're looking at, remain looking at A, and uh, activity reappears in the foveal region to keep, maintain that fixation. Okay, what will have you do some exercise here? Let's suppose uh, you had an A flash and a B flash, but the instructions were only look at B. Where would you see activity in the brain? Okay. Um, all those that think it's the right visual cortex would be active. Let's hit the table. Oh, come on. Okay. All those that think the left visual cortex would be active, hit the table. Okay. That's good. What about the right parietal eye field? Oh, a little bit. Left parietal eye field. Ah, rigorous activity. Right frontal eye field. Left frontal eye field. Great. I think we got it right. Yes, indeed. Okay. So again, um, V1, it, uh, it, what, um, if an A appears here, then an activity will appear here. If a B appears here in the right visual field, then uh, activity will appear in your left visual cortex. And similarly, because you're paying attention to B, only activity here will be appear appearing, not activity here. This will be neglected. And then over here, it'll send a from here, activity will go to here, and that will generate an eye movement and move that hill from the fovea, uh, or, or that activity from the fovea will then reappear after the saccade in the front life fields and maintain fixation. Okay, what happens if the instruction is um, pay attention to A, but instead of um, looking at A, point to A or make an arm movement in that direction? Well, um, again, whatever, if A is on the left, then activity will be on the right. Again, in the um, in the right parietal eye, eye field, and then also in the parietal arm field to, to generate that movement of the arm, but not in um, uh, the parietal eye field because you're asked to not move your eyes. You're asked to just point with your arm. So in summary then, um, the retina and your visual cortex, um, all it requires is a visual stimulus to activate it. Your parietal eye field requires the visual stimulus and attention to select the target for the movement. Your frontal eye field and superior colliculus, they both do the same thing, uh, requires uh, the command to be an ori re orienting response of the eyes. If, on the other hand, you want a movement of the arms, then the parietal 
I arm field will be activated. Okay. Now we'll 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 add memory to the um, to the task. Okay. So, and in this case, a letter um, an object will appear in your visual field but you're asked to remember where it was because you might have to act on it in some way. And so activity will be stored in your working memory and that's located in your parietal, uh, uh, frontal, prefrontal cortex. Uh, PF and for, for short. So this area PF here in the prefrontal cortex will light up. And you'll notice that that even A just flashes briefly when A appears in the visual field. But then the memory of A lasts much longer in here, in, in the um, prefrontal cortex, but also in this uh, parietal eye field because you're asked to attend to that location. Because something might be you might be asked to do something to that location. But because you're not asked to make an eye movement yet, um, you've got activity in your foveal region of the frontal eye fields, maintaining fixation. Okay, what happens when instead two objects flash? So in, in sequence, A and then B. One A over here and B over there. Then two hills of activity will appear in sequence, A and then B. And again, A and B here and A and B here. Okay. And uh, again, these will, because you're, you're remembering these locations and working memory, uh, they'll appear longer than the flash on your eyes. Okay, now what happens when you actually look at one of them? Okay, you can see here, even though these, these di flash and then disappear. Okay, so they're not present in your visual cortex. And then when you make the saccade, these two hills move. So A appears in your fovea, presuming it's not present on your, on your fovea, but it is where you remembered A to be. So if it were to reappear, yes, it would be centered on your fovea. But it's just the memory of A that's moving. And it's the memory of A and B that's moving here. So notice something shifting these memories of objects. And that something is quality discharge, which we took up uh, a few lectures back on, and we took up motion. Okay. It is the, you, so you make your eye movement, and this crawly discharge from making that eye movement that moves the locate, these locations over to where they're supposed to be, over to where they would appear if they were to reappear. Okay. And that's good because that's a use, very useful thing. In real life, if they were to move, okay, they, they're moved here by your coral discharge but they're moved on the retina and on in the visual cortex based on what you're seeing, their actual movement. And then the brain can compare the two where it thinks they should be based on your movement to where they see it to determine, hey, has that object moved? You know, or is it me that's moved? Okay, so they can sort of make sure that the, the quality discharge is working correctly. Okay, the next thing I'd like to cover is 
um, these shift of attention. There are two forms of shifting attention. They can be covert shifts, and covert shift is a shift of attention without the eye moving. So you can imagine that, and these covert shifts can occur a, ro a lot more rapidly than an overt shift. An overt shift is one that involves a saccade. So you can see that an overt is because you can see it happening. Covert is you can't see it happening in somebody else's mind. So here you can imagine that the, the, your, the task is to find um, Waldo. And what, what happens is that you make these covert shift. So you look around all over the place and you come to the conclusion that maybe Waldo is over here. The other thing you should know is that each time you shift your attention, whatever you're looking at it becomes a little more crisp. Okay, So they're, they're pretty faded there because off, they're off the periphery. But uh, somehow shifting your attention to these locations makes these locations more crisp. So there's feedback coming from the frontal eye fields down to the parietal eye fields, back to the visual cortex, tuning up the contrast of that little region, making your ability to distinguish between background and foreground and what's there a little more crisp. So you can guess or be able to detect a little better the presence or absence of Waldo. And then you can make, based on your covert shifts, a more intelligent saccade to where you think Waldo might be and save yourself some energy in terms of making a movement. So you're basically looking for potential targets with covert shifts and you're suppressing um, activity in the foveal region while you're doing that. And finally, at some point, you decide, ah, that's Waldo, and it appears in your fovea. So we're not conscious of making these moments. When, you know, you're looking around the room there for a friend or something like that. You make all these covert shifts, and then finally launch a, uh, uh, an overt shift and all this is, can be done largely unconsciously. But in your mind, you have some feature that you might be hunting for in your, so your, your attention is being directed to some um, characteristic of the object that you're looking for. Okay, the last surprising thing about this wear stream, the interparietal sulcus, is that it's involved in something called numerosity, numbers. And by numerosity, it's not recognizing the number numeral seven or recognizing the numeral nine, you know, the, 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 the character that we use to represent these numbers. By numbers, I mean you know, how big a crowd there is in this room, okay? Um, how many fingers are touching you? Um, and, and sort of um, th sort of three in the abstract sense, not in terms of what its character is. And if you have a lesions, oh, 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 this, this numerosity surprisingly appears in infants before they actually learn how to count. You know, you teach infants, you know, okay, what, you know, count one, two, three, four, five. And so by counting, they learn that the numeral five is bigger than the num numeral three because it comes after one or the other. But be even before they learn these 
the names of the numbers, uh, children know which is more. This, this is a bigger crowd over here. This is a smaller crowd over here. This is a bigger pile of candies over here. They, they learn, they, they know that intuitively. And also, birds know quantities as well. And again, without that, you have trouble with um, making up um, decisions based on numbers and also performing calculations. Now, we saw that the, the, throughout today's lecture, we saw that the IPS has viv, viv, various topological maps. Um, so it, it, some are maps of the retina, some are maps of uh, the auditory space around your head, some are maps of uh, relative to your body. But this is maps of numerosity, so the size of the crowd around you. And so the location is, isn't determined uh, by uh, the, which, how active a particular neuron is. That it's active is important, but how active is not important. But um, it is where it is active. So as in all these other topological maps, it's where the activity occurs that codes where the object is. So numbers work the same way. It's where the activity is within, the, within this IPS that tells you um, where, where, what the size is. So small numbers are usually medial towards the middle of the head, large numbers lateral to the side of the head. The other thing is that there seems to be more space devoted to small numbers and so you can be able to discriminate more, better, between small numbers than large numbers. And so it's kind of remarkable that things like numerosity are being mapped topologically in your IPS. Um, it, it's a very abstract thing, numerosity. It's not like the location. So there's a map here, and you can, you know, map space onto this map. Now you're mapping something abstract, like the number of things. And that suggests that maybe many other places in the cortex are also mapping sort of very abstract things um, in terms of topology, so different locations in different parts of the brain are coding a different abstract quality. And the other thing is that, that when um, I remember as a growing up uh, as a child, my father described how he uh, worked out math problems. And he, like this subject here, would see numbers in this visual space. And small numbers would be over here, large numbers would be over here. And he would, you know, take this number and add it to this number and have another number which is even larger represented over there. So he, he had, and, and a lot of people have these types of maps, see these numbers in their visual space. It's not uncommon and it probably resembles the mapping that's occurring in your IPS. And not surprisingly, also, uh, these, th these maps are, store, are uh, also cause activity in your frontal lobe because that's where your working memory is, where you sort of store these, these quantities. OK, so we've seen that uh, um, in the next session, we'll see this area here along the, just behind the central sulcus. And it is where all your touch information goes to. So it maps um, the surface of your skin onto this 
little strip here, the foot down here and the face and the tongue down here. There's another strip right in front of this one in orange and yellow that maps uh, the location, your sense location of your body parts. So it's the, the, the relative angle of my finger relative to my hand that's being mapped there. And so that information goes to these parietal areas and they ha and as a consequence, you have these maps, and this is a map of carry personal space, the, the area that you can reach to either with your feet or your hands or possibly your head. And that space, surprisingly, can be changed. So in, initially, when you're just with your hand, it's the area you can reach to. If you take on um, uh, a pointer, that area expands. So that map, the topological map, the area that, you know, that it represents, suddenly expands to grow to whatever you can point to. And then that, if you're driving a car, that area expands even more to where the bumpers of the car are. That is, the things, the parts that you want to avoid bumping into something else. So that, that outside of the car becomes your prairie personal space. And if you learn wh where the bump, where that perfect, how far that person, per personal space extend to, you can park in the tightest parking spot without nudging the car in front of you. Okay, I think that's it for today.